welcome to Mandemic Mondays, a podcast hosted by dear friends where we review and debate the latest Netflix release and whatever else we are doing to stay sane in these crazy times we like to call the Mandemic. I'm Mandy Kaplan. And I'm Megan Parlin. And this is uh, going to be my last episode as guest co-host, which is bittersweet because I've had such a great time, but I'm also so excited for the other Mandy to come back. You just summed up my emotions as well. Yeah. But you know what? What I can do, maybe while you guys are recording, I will watch you from my window. I thought you were doing that already. No. Well, now I will. Yes. Woman in the window. This is the movie we watched on Netflix, an adaptation of a novel by A.J. Finn, which was quite zeitgeisty a couple years back. And I remember hearing Amy Adams was going to make the movie. It's Might I correct you? Yeah. The author of the book, A.J. Flynn, Finn or Flynn? I wrote down Finn. Is actually a man named Dan Mallory, who I just did a deep dive on. The New Yorker did like a 20-page article on him. He is a like talented Mr. Ripley level liar who made up stories about having a brain tumor that he never had, that his parents died who never died. Wait, I might have dated Uh, this guy. What's his name? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So just to start there, that, that the author of this book is a total fraud and has a tarnished reputation. Wow. And it's a fascinating read. I recommend it. You sent me the article and I did not read it. And now I feel like a real piece of turd. I actually did not send you the article. Someone did. I didn't want to give that away. Oh, okay. Okay. Not me. Oh. But it's worth, it's it's riveting. Okay, I cool. highly recommend it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Proceed. Yeah. So it's an homage to Hitchcock's Rear Window. And it is... The story of a woman who is an agoraphobe, can't leave her New York apartment. It's really a house. It's a brownstone. And she's spying on all her neighbors through her window. She sees a crime across the street. A woman is stabbed and killed in front of her eyes. She calls the police. The police come. They accuse her of being a drunk and a pill popper, which she is. No one believes her. And she gets enmeshed in this drama. Did I do it in under 20 seconds? I don't think that was under 20, but it was close and darn good. All right. Bless your heart. So right from the opening shot of this movie, which is a close up on Amy Adams's beautiful face, her eyes pop open, but it's a very, very close up shot. So I, of course, obsessed over her skin. Mm. Because we get in there, we get into those pores and and yeah, (laughs) and they did this shot many times. We see her wake up every morning and she has beautiful skin, but this was a very raw version of her. She was seemingly not wearing makeup and it made me love and respect her even more. Kind of like sharp objects. I mean, I don't know if you watched her in that, but yeah, she was very sweaty and just sweating out alcohol in her. Yeah. Very raw. Yeah. And um, I watched this with my husband and Amy Adams is has been on his list of hall passes, Mm -hmm. which he goes back and forth on. But um, yeah, she is. You got to get him to laminate that shit. And then right like (laughs) they did on Friends. Once it's laminated, you can't make changes. No. Yeah. That's called a bandwagon hall pass fan. (laughs) But she is gorgeous. She's gorgeous, but but very real. And I am obsessed with skincare. And so I was like looking at her and I'm like, well, she's not, she doesn't have fine line and fine lines and wrinkles, but that's neither here nor there about the plot of this movie. But that is what I (laughs) cared about the most. Uh And the cat punch. (laughs) So is that when you started crying at a minute? I did not cry in this movie. What? Now you had not read the book. No. So overall, were you surprised? Were you taken by the twist and turns? Or did you know what was going to happen before it happened? I did not know what was going to happen before it happened. And I did not care because I did not like this movie. Um, wow. I will tell you, I'm not I'm not a fan of the horror genre. And I told you I watched it with my husband, Dave, who's actually an editor on a documentary series about horror films. And he's deep divin dived into the genre and including slasher films. Um, and so we watched it together. And so I was a little uncertain about my own opinion of it because I'm not an expert, but he similarly was not 
into the movie. Um, here's how I felt about the movie. It, it's I likened it to when you walk into a restaurant that has a beautiful atmosphere. It's brand new. It's gorgeous. The menu is perfect. The waiter is great. And then you order the food and the plate just doesn't look right. And you taste the food and nothing really goes together. And then you leave just unsatisfied and you want to stop it in and out. It's like this movie had, it was beautiful and it had an amazing cast and it's based on a, on a zeitgeisty novel. And yet it was frenetic and, and, and didn't come together well. And I ended up doing research on it later. And there are reasons why, um, which we can get into, but I don't want to take over too much. But I did no research because I really liked this movie. I had a lot of fun. Uh I went on the ride. I couldn't tell because I had read the book. So I I couldn't tell. Is it going to keep people guessing or are people just going to roll their eyes? And then my brilliant husband like the 15 year old kid is like, knock, knock, knock. And Jer's like, oh, he's going to, who's he murdering in this movie? And, you know, there were things about it that were very obvious, but then there were twists that I don't think Jer didn't see every twist coming, but there are a lot of twists and turns and reveals in this movie, like there were in the book. There were even more in the book. I missed a few elements of the book, but I'm surprised you feel this strongly. I thought it was a great popcorn movie. I'm not saying it was like brilliant filmmaking or actually I really liked the filmmaking, but it was just a good ride. I didn't find it a good ride. I found that they dropped you in at level nine and it just didn't go anywhere from there. They didn't have anywhere to go because every moment had this this false intensity to it. And yes, there were twists and turns, but um yeah, there was there was a review I read about it and they kind of hit the nail on the head. It's you just there's this feeling of not caring about not caring. And that's the way I felt about it, huh. this languish or I just I it, it didn't get me. Um and and I did end up reading about it and and there was a coup d'etat um that made it all make sense for me that that, you know, they started off with one filmmaker. It didn't test well. So Scott Rudin fired everybody and somebody else came in and put it together. And um, Disney hated it. The actors hated it. They bought the actors out of their contract. Netflix took it and like basically have not promoted it at all because the actors just want it to go away. Wow. And, and that's the what that's what I got out of it is like somebody took this over and didn't have the original vision that whoever took it on had. And that's how it felt. I wasn't in good hands. I disagree. I mean, obviously you have the the proof to back that shit up, but I felt like it was a fun ride and I liked some of the directorial choices. And I liked the dialogue. I felt like, because Tracy Letts is a really fantastic playwright and he wrote the screenplay. And yeah. I like I liked how real the dialogue was. There were moments of mammet feeling repetitiveness that I liked and stuttering over what you're saying. It didn't feel like movie dialogue. It felt real and raw to me. And I really liked that. And I, so I'm shocked to hear all this. You have shocked me. I did not see this twist coming. <laughs> I know. Um, I, and I know this is a trope in, you know, the genre of, of, thrillers but i'm also tired of the hysterical woman role mm-hmm. who's you know on volume and i know that this is a callback to old old movies but um i'm i'm tired of that trope um and i just felt like gary oldman who's obviously a a, a phenomenal actor all he did was come on and yell yeah. every time he was on screen he would just yell and then I'm sure it was like a body double of him in the window that he didn't even show up for. It just seemed like they got and Jennifer Jason Lee had like two lines, which is how I prefer. I her. mean, it was such Go a on. waste. <laughs> OK, fine. Not a I, fan. I love her. Um, It was uh, to me a waste of a great cast. I mean, obviously, Amy Adams was in almost every scene mm-hmm. and she did as well. She did a great job. She's, you know, so talented. Mm-hmm. But um, I didn't. It, I mean, I, I just felt like so many wonderful actors were wasted. And, and Anthony Mac, Mackey, mm-hmm. Mackle, Mackie, Mackie mm-hmm. also was on for for like less than a minute. Um, well, he did a lot of voiceover work. You know, the one sh- he did fine. Um, yeah, the the most prominent character was 
the young Joaquin Phoenix type. That's what Jared <laughs> said he looked Ethan. like. I thought he was Brecken Meyery. He does a kind of a combo. Yeah. I'd also say if I was agoraphobic, I would live in that house. Mm-hmm. I mean, what a beautiful place with mm-hmm. unlimited Merlot and movies and <laughs> a hot guy living in the basement. Well, in the book, there there's a character, and I might be misremembering, come at me on social media, but there's a, a woman who works for her at, and like brings her pills and is trying to get her to clean up her life a bit. I remember that character. DoorDash Diane. <laughs> yes. And in the book, she has this online life where she's like in therapy groups with other agoraphobes and really Mm. bonds with one and starts to care about one. And turns out, I think that's Ethan, the teenager, tricking her into revealing all of this personal information about herself. So there was something Mm. about that that I missed in this movie, like Mm -hmm. how he got to know her patterns and her history. And um, yeah, it was a little weird. They were like, the realtor told us your family died. I was like, really? Would a realtor do that? Yeah. And I mean, I'm no expert in agoraphobia, but she was awfully social for an agoraphobe. Like I hardly let that many people in my house and I'm hardly an agoraphobe, but she was just like, come on in, serving them water. And right. So I wrote um, Pete at 5750. This apartment is Grand Central Station. You don't have any idea who could have sent you this. No, the only person who has a key is my tenant, David. Yeah, where is he? I don't know. Are you having problems with David? No. I mean, no. Nothing up here. See? Coast is clear. Can you track the email? Track it. Or trace it, whatever. You track a Gmail account, right? You could have sent this to yourself. I'm sleeping. Or you wanted to look asleep. I'm asleep. What the hell? Dr. Fox, there is no sign that anyone has been here, okay? Nothing is missing. Doors and windows look okay. Someone has been in my house. I have given you proof. She called my office in Boston. Did please, you know that? She has, she has been calling Russell, my please. house. Why were you she fired? She spies on right, her house with right. a camera. She lured my son into her home. He is abusive. She is harassing my son. She is he harassing son. all of us. I saw him hit his son. She's delusional. Ethan told me, Jane told me, I saw him do it. Um, she is Jane. You are a drunk and a drug addict and you, and you made it all up. You almost had me believing that and then I found this. What's this? This is a picture that your wife drew and signed. And you call me delusional, you motherfucker. Hey, hey. It's you. She was here. That proves it. That doesn't prove anything. That proves you're out of your mind. What's happening? Door was open. That scene involved everybody just like bing bong, another person. It's like Pee Wee's Playhouse. They're all just coming in and coming in and coming in and interacting with each other. And she was fine with all of that. I wondered about that, too. I guess, you know, since this is my my last episode on this podcast, um, it really made me reflect on what I've learned watching these Netflix releases, um, you know, as an assignment. And that is that, in my opinion, this is an example of something that was crap that they took and they were like, you know, we're going to get clicks because it's Amy Adams and it's a thriller in the Gone Girl, Mm -hmm. you know, generation. Um, But it was a complete disaster of a of a movie in the end, in my opinion. That's so interesting. Uh, I'm so curious to read these articles and and catch up on what I missed. I just I feel like a dummy. I I I bought it hook, line and sinker. I will say that um, when when Ethan, the teenager, or somebody says to her, are you giving out candy for Halloween? Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you noticed the moment that would have given me PTSD, but she says, no, because if I, even if I just put a bowl out, somebody will steal the bowl. Folks, that happened to us one year. Our porcelain bowl, gone. And the Nerf balls. The Nerf balls? Oh, the Didn't Nerf bullets. Casey, oh, yeah. God. The Nerf bullets. Yeah. So yeah. it's really, uh, that was just a moment I wrote down was like, huh. So it's not just us that fear the the candy bowl being stolen. So I get scared very easily in horror movies. And this, the, the, the scariest moment for me mm-hmm. was when Ethan, the neighbor, mm-hmm. hugs her mm-hmm. and then sneezes on her neck. <laughs> <laughs> that is my idea of a horror film. Not only because that's my germaphobe and that just disgust me. But then I thought, oh, great. Is this going to turn into a 
a pandemic movie, horror movie. I love that you're and calling it horror. I found it's really just a thriller. It's not like a thriller. Yeah. But it, it would have this slasher element at the, at end. the end. Sure. However, yeah. Punch made it through the whole movie, which I found delightfully shocking because whenever like a cute animal is introduced and you know there's a bad guy, you know the animal's going to end up bloody and sending a message. Not punch. Especially a white cat. Right? Yeah, red and white. She Although I wanted to ask you, since I know you're a cat lady, do people ever say good boy to a cat? Like the last scene, Amy Adams said good boy. Because he got and in the carrier. Really... Have you ever tried to put a cat in a carrier? You praise them if they yes. do it. But really, do you ever say good boy? I talk to my cats like they are very intellectual people. And I sing to them. Like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes, I would. I would say good boy to Lamb Chop. OK. All right. That that's felt wrong to me. I will call you out on that. I, I mentioned it before. The device of using voiceover second week in a row uh, mm -hmm. to tell the story with her husband and daughter. Now, in the book, yeah. she's just like, oh, my God, my daughter called and woke me up or, you know, she's just count, recounting these conversations with her family. So I wondered how they were going to do it in the movie. And I found that to be a very effective choice. We're watching her putter around her house and we're hearing that they got into an argument last night and he was writing her about her shrink and and, you know, heads up, everybody, they're dead. They don't exist. But I liked that device. Did you not? I could tell what was happening. Mm -hmm. It felt very sixth sense to me mm -hmm. that they didn't really exist. Okay. But I, yeah, I mean, I don't see any other way they could have done it. So I get it, but it, it didn't grab me. And I liked that they weren't idealized. She, like she was arguing with him as opposed mm -hmm. to just like perfect memories of, you know, my loving, perfect husband who's so supportive and sweet and my daughter who's perfect. Like even in her imagination, they were flawed and their relationship was fraught with tension, which I liked. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, what did it get on yeah. Rotten Tomatoes? Now I feel like a dumbass. It got it's not good. Oh, it's not good. No, I know. I hated I this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's either in the 30s or the 50s. One of those. But yeah, below anything good. You you're a music nerd. Did you like the music at least? I did. Yes. I mean, I liked I, I appreciated the the parallels with Hitchcock and, you know, I, I see where they were going, it, but it also felt heavy handed and, um, and just not, just, just not elegant, but it was fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I it shouldn't have been any other way. The music. Yeah. I loved the music. Uh, Pete 2715. Let's hear it. I'm out here right now. Leave a message and I'll do my best to get back to you. David? You referenced it as being Hitchcockian. It is. And it's so old movie and classic. And I thought it was really nicely done. I didn't write down the name of the composer because I'm an ass. But, but I, I thought the music was a very strong homage to Rear Window. Yeah, there were a lot of homages. Um, just strung together, in my opinion, very clunkily and it, i mean I, I keep making these analogies but i remember watching big little lies season two and wondering like why does this suck this season i love season one and it's the same cast and and you know it just the pacing was off and scenes were too short um and then of course you know it, there was a coup and that this to me had the same essence of that okay so you referenced big little lies as and did you read that book i forget Yes, I did. Okay. And I read the book and loved it. And then I also loved the first season of the show. I found it to be a really worthy adaptation. So my question to you, Megan, is putting you on the spot. What what are adaptations that you have really loved of books you've loved? Because it's hard to do. Well, the one that comes to mind is The House of Sand and Fog is one of my favorite oh. adaptations. Never read it, never seen I it. I loved 
Oh, yeah. Both were equally strong, in my opinion. But I know it's it's a tough it's a tough thing to do. I think people are getting better at it these days. I thought um, I thought Gone Girl was done well. I mean, I liked the book better, Mm -hmm. um, but I liked the movie Mm -hmm. just fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, My favorite is Color Purple because that's my favorite book. And then they made this Mm -hmm. flawless movie of it and honored the book, but veered from it in a lot of ways. And I I just really loved it. So my question, um, since you read the book, the last, I, I, spoiler alert, you know, she's suicidal, but then she, her life is is also in danger by someone who's trying to kill her. And my husband brought this up, like in theory, that notion of wanting to take your own life, but then also your life is is in danger and the will to live comes out of you. Like mm-hmm. that should have been breathtaking. Like that should have, and, and it wasn't for me watching. I'm like, it just was seeing a lot of blood and hysteria. Um, did it feel different in the book? Did you like the way that was executed? I'm not going to lie. I don't quite remember it, but I likened it to like, I'm going to break up with you before you can break up with me. Like, it's okay if I do it, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to let you do it. And yeah, she took a a hoe to the face, like or a three-pronged gardening tool to the yeah. face. That was graphic. So you would understand why she'd be like, sure, I'll kill myself with some pills and wine. That sounds peaceful and lovely, but I'm not going to let you do it. I don't quite remember that moment in the book. That could have been a very powerful conflict that it just was all wrapped up in madness. Yeah. I, that's the nature of this genre. And it, it doesn't bother me. I liked it. One thing that I li- I liked the red herring of the the downstairs tenant played by uh, Wyatt Russell. Like, is mm-hmm. he the guy has is he doing this to her? Is he stalking her in the book? They sleep together one night and it gets all sorts of weird. Of course. But in the movie, they didn't. And then right at one point. So she's an agoraphobe suffering from the loss of her family, anxiety. She's a horrible drug addict and why no? And he jumps out and goes, boo, at one point. And I was like, really? You, oh, really? A person would scare a, a person like that? Well, speaking of their interactions, like the mo- the movie lost me in the very beginning when I noticed the exposition when she's like, David, you have been my tenant for three years. It's like, okay, feed me the info. It it just was Mm. like, to me, that was a sign that this is going to feel expository. And I don't like that. I hate that, but I didn't even notice it. I was counting Mm. her pores. I didn't notice (laughs) exposition. This is where we went wrong. Rotten Tomatoes wasn't counting pores, but Mandy was. Thank you. Yes, I, I... bring that extra eye. I one thing I questioned was there were moments where we were seeing her hallucinations or her vivid memories of Julianne Moore in the apartment even though we knew Julianne Moore wasn't currently in the apartment which I bought. But then at the end she sees her upside down vehicle, her snow covered upside down vehicle in the apartment and I was like did did they earn that moment? I don't think so. That felt yeah, very that artsy fartsy from? and like, oh, this will be a beautiful choice, but it didn't feel earned. Yeah, I agree. It was like just throwing throwing in another, you know, bell and whistle to the mess. Mm-hmm. But I love Julianne Moore as a blonde. I'm glad you brought that up. My next question, and take some time to think about it. This is not an easy question to answer, but immediately I said, I would phone Julianne Moore. And Jer said, hell yeah. What about you guys? We did not have that conversation, but I did think it. I, she, she turns me on. She's Ooh. hot and, and I like, yeah. And I just loved her little outfit and her, um, her voice was a bit different. She, mm-hmm. she did a slightly higher intonation than she usually has. And her, her manic energy. I liked her a lot and she really only yeah. has one scene. So she, she could come and tear it up for a couple of days and then go on her merry way. All of them could have, I mean, did that basically, except Amy Adams. There were a few tropey moments that I rolled my eyes at. And one of the biggest ones is you have to have a lady like that in the bathtub at some point being scared in the bathtub. And that bathtub required by Hollywood law to be a clawfoot tub. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. It has Mm -mm. to be a clawfoot tub. It is such a trope. Like, not all of us have 
a big open clawfoot tub where we take our glamorous baths and get scared. I mean, that brownstone was just breathtaking. Everything about it was beautiful. Um, I I could see it, them making a decision to just make her her life just more of a mess, but it was gorgeous. And that first shot of her of her eyes that you were talking about when you were counting poor is also tropey. I mean, clearly a callback to Psycho. And, you know, mm-hmm. um, it, it was pretty obvious. Lots of callbacks. I One thing occurred to me, I have uh, shrinks and therapists in my family. And mm-hmm. when she was getting to know Julianne Moore and Julianne Moore started to say something and Amy Adams plays a therapist and she like doesn't converse with her the way we normally would, right? Like if you're getting to know a lady and the lady says something, you'd be like, oh, when did that happen? Oh, you know, did you freak mm-hmm. out? Blah, 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 blah. But Amy Adams is nodding and listening. And it brought up something that the movie doesn't even touch upon. It, just the idea of like, if you are a therapist, how does that affect your friendships? Do you often leave those long pauses? Because therapists aren't supposed to, supposed to interject, right? They're supposed to just let you organically reveal your feelings. Well, I, let's see, I have a best friend who's a therapist and it's kind of like a chef who doesn't cook at home. Mm. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't act therapisty around me and throws all that out the window. Um, not that she's like a terrible listener or anything, but I don't feel like I'm talking to a therapist. Um, she says things like, what are you, a dumbass? (laughs) (laughs) What the fuck is wrong with you? She slaps me. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I just, thought it was interesting. And then we see her in therapy. And in the beginning of the movie, you can't tell who the therapist is and who the patient is initially, because they're both playing those like therapist games, trying to draw the other one out. Yeah. And then when she was trying to interact with Ethan in in a counselor type way, you could see almost like she was trying to channel this inner part of her that is so dead inside, but she was desperate to be that again. Mm -hmm. So I did see a glimmer of that, which gave, I mean, that's the great thing about Amy Adams is you can see her inner world. She's done the work and um, she's, yeah, she's a, she's so talented. I love her. At the end of the movie, I just wanted them to cut to, that's how you know. Like she's just so light and radiant and beautiful. And she was that at the end of the movie. And it was funny to me to think she would skip through the city and immediately become Giselle from Enchanted for anyone who didn't get that. And she does that. (laughs) I got it. (laughs) She does that so well um, where when she goes kind of back and forth in time or between worlds and she can go from like distraught, pasty, slightly homely to gorgeous, radiant, bright. I mean, it's amazing. It's it's. Uh, truly mind-blowing how she does that. We love you, Amy Adams. Even though we hated this movie, and I think you did too. And I will say, remember I texted you like, I can't find it. It was really bizarre. It wasn't coming up in the search. And then we found it, but in a very circuitous way. Um, We even did a Netflix update thinking it was an app thing on our end. But um, I wondered if, because Netflix has deliberately done very little to promote this, if maybe their algorithms were (laughs) asleep. The engineers were like, yeah, we'll just turn that X into a Y and who cares? I don't know. I'm going to read all about it now. I can't wait. I took a deep dive. I even listened to podcasts about it. I was like this because I really, I was, I, I doubt, I doubted myself because I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of the genre, mm-hmm. and I just wanted to understand what I was feeling. So, well, you have enlightened me. How many man jobs would you give it? I would give it one and a half manned jobs. Okay, I would give it three and a half. I found it entertaining and flawed, but I liked it. Okay, I'm shocked at the disagreement, but there it is. There it is. We finally, well, we had a couple on this journey, but I'm glad we could end on some tension finally. Will will our friendship survive it? That's the question. We'll check back. So Mandy, since this is my last episode co-hosting, I know. <laughs> How do I keep up with you and Mandy, you know, in every way possible. 
Well, aside from our normal morning talks and our <laughs> and our obsessive I friendship, more. more you can find us more. Then find us on Letterboxd because that's where we're going to be as we are doing our reviews of all the movies we watch. And uh, it's a really fun, they call it the Goodreads for films. It's a fun place to talk movies and find out about movies and find out what we think of movies. Gosh, and what a great thing, especially for like for this movie, The Woman in the Window was a book and a movie, Goodreads, Letterboxd. Come on, perfect. Little cross promotion there. Yeah, we actually have our own promo code now. If you go to letterboxd.com slash pro and enter the code MANDEMIC, you can get 20% off upgrading to a pro or patron account. And they come with all these cool extra features and you can do way more on the site. And it's a really great place to see topless pictures of the Mandys. I mean, movie reviews that the Mandys write. Oh, well, where are the topless pictures? Because also, I'll text you. <laughs> I'm all there. See you on Letterboxd. See you there. So what else are you doing to stay sane? (laughs) So I feel like since this is my last episode, I need to come clean about something that I do that I um, was holding back on because it seems so cliche. Is it the booger farm? I (laughs) don't do that anymore sometimes. Um, I bake bread. I bake sourdough bread. However, I have been doing this for over three years. This was long before the pandemic. My husband, Dave, got me um, for my birthday, got us classes to take a bread baking class with um, an incredible teacher named Mary Parr. She has a website called breadculture.org. And I was hooked. And I have a starter named Sammy. Um, I have shared my starter with friends and family. So there's a whole lineage happening of my starter. Um, and it feeds my family. I, we eat it every day. It's very healthy. I do 100% whole grain, which I've learned is very rare because it's hard to work with and it's extremely healthy. It's not like the Instagram fluffy, doughy, holy type. It's like real bread. Um, yeah. And my daughter, Kayla, loves to score which means decorate the bread with me with Mm -hmm. designs and patterns. And um, yeah, I've been doing, I can count probably on my hand the amount of weeks I've skipped because I bake almost every week. Even when my daughter Sasha was born, I was mixing dough um, and I was literally nursing her while mixing the dough, which probably explains why we had so much trouble breastfeeding because I had my priorities (laughs) all out of whack. She ended up dropping weight that week. And so I don't recommend that. But how was that loaf of bread? It was a brilliant loaf of bread. Um, And and then I found out you can't feed newborns bread. So, hey. (laughs) Um, But I do bake bread and it has kept me sane and it's my ritual. So there. Uh, Yes. And therefore, you got grandfathered in before my annoyance. My annoyance was just like, for some reason, month two of the pandemic, everybody just started baking bread, talking about bread, obsessing over bread, posting about bread. And I, it became the thing that I was like, I don't want to hear about your freaking bread anymore, people. But you, you got a pass because you, you had been doing it. Before it was cool. And I'm not even on social media anymore. So I don't feed into that, um, that machine. Right. And yeah, it is interesting. And, and, I, you know, I wanted to prove to myself that this is something that I will do every week before I started spending money on stuff. And I have been, it's like one of the few things that has stuck around for me. So it's not a f- passing pandemic phase. This is like, this is me. I'll allow it, but only from you. And you don't even eat bread. So I don't eat No bread. wonder you're a hater. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, why isn't everybody making cheese? Um, well, I don't know if you've noticed how contoured and different I look on the Zoom. You could probably tell. Just say you can tell so I don't cry. Is that because of the beta settings that I turned you on to? No, but that's exciting. The lipstick phase. Well, when we do Zooms, so the pandemic has made, forced us all to stare at ourselves on Zoom. And... It's forced some of us, namely me, to, um, how do I phrase this mildly, hate my face. And I've always been a person who loved makeup and face products. A serum really gets me excited. But in the pandemic with the Zoom, I have been obsessively watching like 
makeup tutorial videos, which is something I never did before. Uh, Obsessively trying samples of new serums and everything. And the thing that I learned this week, and I didn't write down her name, so I apologize, from this lovely lady who did a tutorial. And I love when they do half their face so you can really see the difference. She showed me how to do the threes on my face with bronzer, something I've never done. Mm. You start up at the center of your forehead and you go down the side under your jawline. I mean, under your cheekbone, excuse me. And then you swing back up around and go under your jawline with your bronzer to give contour. Yeah, it's a cursive E. Yeah, I learned that a long time ago when I started using Bare Essentials and they had a little video. That was like the only makeup tip I've ever learned. I never knew about it. So... Now my modeling career is taking off. I've always been a busy Mm -hmm. person, but now that I'm an international supermodel with my threes on my face. (laughs) um, A three, right. It's probably a better analogy than a hand writing E. (laughs) It just depends on which side that it becomes a Hebrew E if you're on the other side and it's very confusing. So, Or boobs if you're facing down. Oh yeah, it could be boobs, but I don't know where the nipples are. Maybe that's the apples of your cheeks. Butts, butts. Okay. Butt cheeks. There you go. So yeah, so I've been really leaning into my skin care rituals and my makeup. And that's why when Amy Adams' eyes popped open, I was like, ooh, what is she wearing? How does she keep her skin, you know, looking youthful and vibrant? Because it is all, as I watch Zoom, my face is starting to melt and I feel like I look like the Crypt Keeper. So I'm trying to keep it tight. You look beautiful. That's all we needed to hear. Thanks for filling in for Mandy (laughs) Fabian, who will be back next week. Oh, thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. And thanks for giving me something to do. Absolutely. Your check is in the mail. No worries. And you are leaving us at a fantastic time because the next week we are watching Army of the Dead, the Zack Snyder two and a half plus hour epic zombie battle movie that takes place in Vegas. This is something Mandy and I are not... It's not a genre we usually enjoy, so it should be interesting and hopefully a pleasant surprise. Thank God. Yes, you dodged (laughs) that bullet. You just made my... uh, You just made this a little bit easier to say goodbye. Okay, well, if anybody wants to send their farewells to Megan Parlin for now. You can do it through me on social media at Mandy underscore Kaplan underscore Clavens on Instagram and Twitter. And I love you, Meg. Love you too. Thanks for having me and welcome back to Mandy. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.